Welcome to An Introduction to Ayurveda, presented by Dr. Mark Halpern, founder and director of the California College of Ayurveda, with classes held in both Northern and Southern California. This introduction will provide you with an overview of Ayurveda and will help you get started on your path to better health. And now, Dr. Mark Halpern. Hello. My name is Dr. Mark Halpern, and I'd like to thank you for watching this video and for taking the time to educate yourself about Ayurveda. Ayurveda is very special to me because it's through Ayurveda that I was able to heal myself from a life-threatening and debilitating form of arthritis. Since that time, as a practitioner, I've seen thousands of other people heal themselves as well through this great science of Ayurveda. Ayurveda literally means the science of the knowledge of life. It's an ancient healing science from India which dates back more than 5,000 years ago. Because of its ancient roots, it's often referred to as the mother of all healing. Ayurveda has a unique understanding of disease. In Ayurveda, we understand disease to be the natural end result of living out of harmony. Now, an important word here is that disease is natural. When we live out of harmony, our bodies want to communicate that disharmony to us. And the message of the body is our symptoms. Healing, on the other hand, is the reverse. Healing occurs when we learn to live in harmony with our environment. And this is the science of Ayurveda. In fact, when we learn to live in harmony with our environment, the body's potential to heal is maximized. And now Dr. Halpern will explain the five elements which make up all of creation. The five elements is the ancient science of the rishis from ancient India. The science was very different than modern science. It was based on an understanding of our environment and the world that we live in. The ancient rishis told us that everything in nature is made up of five elements. The five elements are earth, air, fire, water, and ether. Now these five elements are not meant to be taken literally. Not everything that is said to have fire within it actually has a flame burning inside it but rather it has the qualities of each of these five elements. In fact, these five elements are more like ideas or metaphors. Earth, for instance, is the idea of solidity. For instance, a chair feels solid. We would say in Ayurveda that it has a lot of earth within it. Water is the idea of flow. It's also the idea of moistness. Anything that's moist or anything that flows is said to have water in it, even if it's oil. We know that oil doesn't have water within it, but because it has qualities similar to water, we would say that that is the element that makes up oil or water. Fire is the idea of light, transformation, or illumination. In our bodies, for instance, we have a digestive fire, and that fire is responsible for transforming the food that we eat into small components that eventually become our bodies. And then there's air. And air is the idea of motion or movement. For example, a butterfly or a bumblebee flutters about very, very quickly, moves from place to place. This movement is governed by the element air. And finally, there's the fifth element, ether. And ether is a hard element to understand because it's very, very subtle. You can't taste it. You can't touch it. You can't smell it. So what exactly is ether? Ether is the idea of connectedness. It's that which connects all things together. It's that which exists in between things. We could say that ether is much like space. So there we have the five elements, earth, air, fire, water, and ether. And these five elements and combinations of these five elements make up all of creation. Now these five elements create all of nature, including the three fundamental energies that govern the functioning of our bodies. These fundamental energies are called doshas. Their names are vata, pitta, and kapha. Each of us inherently has a unique balance of these three energies within us. That balance was determined at the moment of conception and is with us the rest of our lives, and it never changes. Our constitution determines what we're naturally attracted to and what repels us, what's in harmony with our nature, and what will cause us to become out of balance and hence sick and diseased. Understanding our constitution gives us a certain power an ability to create an environment that's supportive to who we are as a unique individual. And now Dr. Halpern will explain the three doshas, the biological energies that govern the functioning of our bodies. 
So let's take a look at each of these three doshas. The vata dosha can be described as being made up of the elements air and ether. Now, air and ether have certain qualities. In fact, all of nature has certain qualities. These qualities could be described as opposites. For instance, everything in nature is either warm or cool, heavy or light, moist or dry, mobile or stable. Therefore, vata is a combination of air and ether. In order to understand vata, we want to understand its qualities. If we were to look at the qualities of vata, we would think of it to be very much like the wind. Is the wind heavy or is it light? Well, naturally, it's light. Is it dry or is it moist? When the wind blows against our body, it dries out our body. Therefore, it's dry. Is it mobile or is it stable? Well, everybody knows that the wind moves. It moves very rapidly and it changes directions often. So vata is dry, light, and mobile. Is it cool or is it warm? Well, as it blows against our body, it also cools us down. So the basic qualities of vata dosha would be dry, light, mobile, and cooling. When we come into contact with anything with these qualities, if we ingest cold, light food, it increases the vata energy within ourselves, and this can lead to imbalances. The next dosha is pitta, and pitta is made up of fire and water. It's mostly fire, and it has qualities very similar to fire. What are these qualities? Is fire hot or is it cold? Everybody knows that fire is hot. Is it heavy or is it light? It certainly doesn't have much weight to it, so it's light. Is it mobile or is it stable? Well, the wind can very easily push the fire. So we say that, that fire is unstable. And is it dry or is it moist? Well, fire and water. The fire is dry, the water has quite a bit of moistness to it, but together it's only a little bit moist. So therefore we can say that pitta is hot, light, unstable, and it's neither too dry or too moist. Now, let's take a look at the third dosha, which is kapha. Kapha is made up of the elements water and earth. What do they combine together to form? Mud. Kapha is very much like mud, and it has very similar qualities to mud. What are these qualities? Is it heavy or light? Well, if you've ever tried to carry a bucket of mud, you know that it's very, very heavy. Is it warm or is it cool? Well, if you put your hand into mud, the deeper you go, the cooler it gets. Water and earth have no heating element to it. Therefore, it's cool. Is it stable or is it unstable? Well, while mud can move, it's going to take a lot of energy to move mud. Therefore, it's relatively stable. And is it dry or is it moist? Well, it's mud. It has water in it. Therefore, it's moist. So the qualities of kapha, therefore, are cool, heavy, moist, and relatively stable. Now, it's important to understand that all three of these doshas exist within each person, and that we're all a unique combination of these three doshic types. In fact, there are an infinite number of combinations and permutations of these three doshas that make up who we are as a unique individual. And that's why each person's path toward perfect health will be equally unique. Now Dr. Halpern will discuss our constitutions or doshic body type. And now let's take a look at a stereotypical picture of each of the individual doshic types. First, let's take a look at vata. People of vata nature tend to exhibit the qualities of vata. They tend to be dry, light, cold, and more mobile. A person of vata predominant nature has certain characteristic features. They tend to have long, thin bones long, thin fingers. They tend to have minimal muscular development. They tend to be thin. They tend to have long, oval faces. They also tend to have thin hair, hair that's thinning on top. They may, in the body, experience constipation, gas. They also tend to experience more nervousness in their bodies, more twitches. They tend to have a little bit more anxiety. They tend to move quickly. Now, a person of pitta nature tends to have a more moderate body build. Their hair tends to be thin and a little bit oily. Their face is angular. They tend to have deep set, more penetrating eyes. They tend to have moderate musculature, but good definition. They tend to have more heat in their digestive system, and that heat might produce burning indigestion. It might also create loose stools. 
Pitta also tends to create weakness in certain organs in the body, particularly the liver, the spleen, the blood, and the eyes. Even the metabolism can be affected as well. Now, a person of kapha nature tends to have a more thicker, denser body build. They tend to have thick hair, coarse hair. They tend to have rounder faces, shorter necks. They tend to have good musculature. It tends to be a little bit stocky. Their bones tend to be dense. Their skin tends to be thick. In their bodies, inside their bodies, they tend to produce more mucus. Mucus is the mud of the body. So they tend to be congested and are more prone to uh, sinusitis and, and coughs. They also tend to accumulate more water in their body. They tend to be prone to swelling in the body. The thicker, denser nature of kapha tends to give them more stability. And it's that stability that allows kapha to be more resistant to disease than most other individuals. Now, as I was describing these three stereotypical constitutional types to you, you may have said to yourself, gee, I sound like that one, or gee, I sound like that one. On the other hand, you might have said, well, I'm a little bit of this, and I'm a little bit of that. Well, remember, we're all a unique combination of these three constitutional types. God made us all individuals, and each one of us is going to have certain tendencies. Ayurveda is the science of understanding who you are as a unique person and what your path is back to health. Dr. Halpern will now explain the three gunas, the key to understanding our psychological and spiritual natures. Now, in order to completely understand who we are, we have to know more than just our physical constitution. We must also know who we are emotionally and who we are spiritually. In order to understand this, Ayurveda brings in a new concept. It's the concept of the three gunas, or the three qualities of all of nature. Everything in nature is said to be made up of these three qualities, sattva, rajas, and tamas. Now, sattva is the quality of clarity or purity. When our minds are clear and pure, it's as though the light of God is reflected through us. We could think of the state of mind of being sattvic as being like a clear, still lake, peaceful and tranquil. Then there's the state of rajas. And rajas is distraction and turbulence. Think of that same lake. Imagine that a rock was thrown into that lake. This is the state of rajas. Each of the waves that the rock makes, each of those ripples is a ripple within our mind. It's a challenging emotion within our mind. And then there's tamas. And tamas is a state of darkness, a state of inertia, a state of heaviness. Imagine that same lake. And imagine that you took a stick. And that stick stirred up the lake, and the lake became muddy. That darkness within our mind manifests as our own darker nature. It's our capacity to cause harm to ourselves or to cause harm to, harm to others. Now, let's take a look at each individual dosha type. And let's try to understand that person from a sattvic, a rajasic, and a tamasic perspective. Now, when a person of vata nature has a more sattvic mind, a more clear, tranquil mind, they express their higher qualities. Their higher qualities include that of being genuinely enthusiastic. Enthusiasm comes from the Greek word theos, which means God. They genuinely express the God within them. It's like a light that shines through their eyes. Their enthusiasm is infectious, and they're deeply inspired. Inspired comes from the word inspiration. To be inspired means to express the spirit within us. These individuals are very creative. They make excellent uh, artists and excellent healers. And oftentimes, just being in a room with a person of Vada nature, if their mind is tranquil and sattvic, helps a person to feel better. Throw a rock in their waters, and the challenging emotions that manifest within their mind are the colder emotions of fear, worry, nervousness, and anxiety. Now, imagine that we were to stir up the mud for just a little bit, and their mind was become more dark, more cloudy. Their own darker nature would begin to emerge. The darker nature of vata is to become harmful predominantly to themselves, usually through self-destructive behaviors such as addiction, and on the extreme end, suicide. So as you can see, there's a great spectrum that a person of vata nature can manifest within this world. On the one hand, they could be a divinely inspired, creative individual. And on the other hand, they can be a, a paranoid, suicidal individual. And there's everything in between. Now, a person of Pitta nature also has a distinctive personality. 
I like to think of their personality much like I think of a bull. Very clear, very focused, very intense. They like to have clear goals. They like to accomplish those goals. And then they move on to the next goal, and then the next one. People of Pitta nature are very, very focused individuals. Now, they also have a wide, a wide spectrum from which they might manifest within this world. In their more sattvic expression, their higher nature begins to manifest, to emerge. And in this nature, they tend to be like a beacon of light. That strong fire within them burns brightly, and it attracts others. For this reason, they tend to make excellent teachers, leaders, and guides. They're able to discern truth from falsehood, throw a rock in their water, and their more rajasic nature begins to emerge. Each of those ripples is a heated emotion that burns within the mind. People of Pitta nature, in their more rajasic expression, are prone to heated emotions such as jealousy, anger, resentment, envy. Stir up their waters, stir up the mud, and their darker nature begins to manifest. Their tamasic nature tends to be harmful to other people. They tend to be prone to more violence and more vindictive behaviors. So once again, we can see that we have a wide spectrum from which a person of Pitta nature might begin to manifest. On the one hand, they might be a clear-seeing teacher or leader, and on the other hand, they might be a violent and vindictive individual. And then there are people of Kapha nature, and they too have a very distinctive personality. I like to think of Kapha as much like I think of a turtle. They tend to move very slowly. They tend to talk very slowly. Their mind moves slow, their bodies move slow. This is their distinctive characteristic. In their sattvic expression, people of Kapha nature are very loving, very kind, very devoted individuals. They have this wonderful capacity for unconditional love. I often think of them much like I think of a great mother with her arms wide open, welcoming all her children. That's how much love a person of Kapha nature in their sattvic expression has. In their more rajasic expression, throw a rock in their water, and they tend to be prone to desire and comforts, and they tend to be prone toward wanting things and accumulating things. Attachment is one of their challenges. Stir up their mud, and their darker nature begins to manifest. That desire for comfort, that desire for attachment, turns into greed. Nothing will satiate their appetite. Eventually, they turn toward behaviors that would be harmful to others, behaviors such as thievery and stealing to try to fulfill all their desires. Once again, we see that a person of Kapha nature can have a personality that manifests in a great number of ways. On the one hand, a person capable of tremendous unconditional love, and on the other hand, a person who is so desirous that they resort to thievery. So now we can see that in Ayurveda, the path to healing is not simply to balance the doshas, but also to try to cultivate our more sattvic nature, to try to help our minds to become clear and pure so that the light of God can manifest within us and so that we can manifest our highest potential. Now let's take a look at the path of healing for each of the constitutional types. As a person of vata nature begins to open up to God, their more sattvic nature begins to manifest they begin to realize that the universe is going to continue to unfold, whether we worry about it or not. And therefore, there's really nothing to worry about. There's nothing that we can do about it. In addition, a person of Vada nature begins to realize that even the challenges that we experience in our lives are perfect for us. They're a reflection of the nature of the growth of our soul, and they give us opportunities to grow and to move forward. The antidote to fear is faith. When we have faith in ourselves and we have faith in a higher power, we begin to realize these truths and then peace of mind replaces fear. Now for a person of Pitta nature who's challenged by heated emotions such as anger, resentment, jealousy, as they begin to open up to their higher nature, as they begin to open up to God and their, their highest potential begins to emerge, they begin to realize that each person is a soul who's growing, learning, and evolving, and not necessarily perfect. We all make mistakes. With this realization, a person of Pitta nature becomes less judgmental. Judgment is at the root of anger. When we begin to see the world in a black and white way, 
when we begin to think that somebody did something wrong and therefore we're angry about it, or somebody did something intentionally to harm us, well, we begin to feel angry. But as we learn to let go of judgment, as we learn to see each individual as a soul who's growing, learning, and evolving, what replaces anger is compassion. And that compassion frees up the mind and the body for healing to take place. Now, for a person of Kapha nature whose challenges are uh, desire and comfort and greed, the antidote to these emotions is to see through the illusion, is to see things more clearly, to realize that none of these things will truly bring the satisfaction that the person of Kapha nature desires. In order for a person of Kapha nature to heal, they need to cultivate the fire within their mind to burn through the illusion. They need to cultivate the ability to let go. They begin to experience their devotional and unconditionally loving nature. So in summary, for a person of Vata nature, they must learn to cultivate faith. Faith is the antidote to fear, worry, nervousness, and anxiety. For a person of Pitta nature, they must begin to understand that we are all souls growing, learning, and evolving. And with that realization, they are able to begin to let go of judgment. Judgment is the, or letting go of judgment is the antidote to anger. Letting go of judgment is the antidote to envy and jealousy. And for a person of Kapha nature, the antidote to their desire, the antidote to their attachments is to see through the material illusions, to see through the illusion and to realize that all of these things that they are attached to are transient in nature. Now, in order to heal ourselves through Ayurveda, therefore, we must not only balance the doshas, but remember, we must also cultivate sattva. This is what makes Ayurveda unique. This is what makes Ayurveda truly holistic. It's a body, mind, and spirit form of healing. Now, in order to cultivate sattva, and in order to bring our doshas back into balance, Ayurveda utilizes the five senses of our bodies. It's through the five senses that we relate to our environment. Remember, when our relationship with our environment is harmonious, our bodies will express that harmony in the form of good health. And when our relationship with our environment is disharmonious, our bodies express that as well in the form of disease. So Ayurveda uses many therapies in order to help you to heal. It's going to utilize diet and herbs in order to treat you through your sense of taste. And Ayurveda utilizes your sense of smell through aromatherapy, your sense of hearing through sound therapies, such as the utilization of music and mantra. And Ayurveda also uses our sense of touch with Ayurvedic massage techniques and the use of special oils. So you can see that Ayurveda uses many, many therapies in order to help you. Therapies that are not only for your physical body, but therapies that are also for your mind. Specifically, for the mind, Ayurveda also utilizes meditation and yoga. In addition, Ayurveda uses very specialized therapies to help purify our bodies of accumulated toxins. These therapies are called pancha karma, meaning the five therapies that remove these toxins from our body and the therapies that also rebuild the internal strength of our body. These therapies are called rejuvenation therapies. Perhaps most important of all is Ayurvedic lifestyle. Lifestyle is indeed the most important part of a good health regimen. It's what's going to help you to prevent disease from occurring again in the future. Your Ayurvedic specialist will discuss with you each of these lifestyle regimens and routines and will help you to create a lifestyle that's in balance and harmony with your environment. Now the first thing that your Ayurvedic specialist will do with you is a consultation and an examination in order to help determine exactly what is your constitution and what is the nature of the imbalance. It's very much like painting a picture. During that, con during that consultation, your Ayurvedic specialist will be gathering information. Together you're painting a picture which you'll then both begin to look at. This picture is who you are as a unique individual. Looking at it, we can begin to see where you're living in harmony and where you're living out of harmony and how that disharmony is beginning to create the disease that you might be experiencing. 
from that picture, your Ayurvedic specialist will begin to develop a plan in order to help you to move back into harmony. In Ayurveda, we say that it's more important what our patients understand than what the doctor or the practitioner can do for the patient. In other words, Ayurveda is a path of self-awareness and self-understanding. The more you know and the more you understand, the more likely you are to be able to follow the practices, to be able to do the things that your Ayurvedic specialist asks you to do in order to create optimum health. Your Ayurvedic specialist is one part teacher, one part guide, one part healer on your journey back to health. It's important to understand that while your Ayurvedic specialist can give you guidance and can help you along on your journey, ultimately, only you can make the changes in your life that are going to bring about good health. So be patient with yourself and don't go too fast. We would rather see you make one change, one real change at the core of who you are than to learn lots and lots of things that you should do but never do any of them. Even one change made shifts your consciousness and as your consciousness shifts your body reflects that consciousness, the new consciousness, the healthy consciousness. So be patient with yourself and go slow. Healing is a process. There are no magic pills. You can expect that it's going to take time to make real changes in your life. It's important for you to make a commitment to your Ayurvedic care, to make a commitment to a six to 12 month program. During this period of time, your Ayurvedic specialist will guide you in making the changes that are necessary to bring about good health. Those changes will come about one at a time. They'll come about slowly, but in time you'll look back and you'll see how far you've traveled. You'll see how much progress you've made. And you'll also see how much better you're feeling. So let me leave you with a parting thought. You are already perfect. Your body is already healthy. Healing is the process of remembering. It's the process of remembering your true nature, your essence. The, your true nature already knows how to live in harmony with your environment. But through our lifestyle, we've forgotten. It's the role of your Ayurvedic specialist to help guide you back to that memory. We all have the capacity to heal. Our body's capabilities are infinite. You can be well. There's no limits to what your body can do when you're living in harmony. When you live in harmony, you're creating within your body the optimum environment for healing to occur. In that environment, your body will reach its maximum potential, whatever that potential is, whatever your unique potential is. But embrace your health, embrace your well-being, allow yourself to be perfectly healthy. Thank you. Thank you.